hope we will look back and say, what was most amazing about this period is the speed at which we developed the vaccines and tested and distributed them. It took us four years just to identify the virus that caused AIDS in the 80s. So just imagine COVID where it's four years before we even know what is causing the outbreak. That's what would have happened if this just shifted 20 years, 30 years earlier in terms of when this outbreak happened. The rapid advance in vaccine technology, which is bringing an end to the COVID-19 pandemic, is best understood in the context of a series of innovations that more than doubled life expectancy over the last hundred years. This is the single most incredible thing that's happened in a century, argues the science writer Stephen Johnson in his new book, Extra Life, A Short History of Living Longer, which is also running as a series on PBS. It's one of the greatest achievements in human history. The book explores how innovations in epidemiological statistics, artificial fertilizer, toilets and sanitation systems, vaccines, and more have allowed billions of people to flourish until old age. Author and host Johnson was a founder of the pioneering website Feed in the 1990s and has authored a shelf full of books about human progress, including bestsellers such as The Ghost Map, which recounted how doctors and researchers ended the threat of cholera in 19th century London, and Future Perfect, which argues that the modern network world is far more resilient than previous iterations. It's a he talks with reason about how humans managed to massively increase their lifespan in the 20th century and whether we might do even better in the 21st. Stephen Johnson, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks for having me. Uh, what's the elevator pitch of Extra Life, A Short History of Living Longer? It's right there in the subtitle, I guess. But uh, the basic elevator pitch is the simple fact of the story of life expectancy globally over the past hundred years. If you rewound the clock to the kind of end of the Spanish flu in 1920, life expectancy in the United States was about 41. Globally, it was probably somewhere around 35. And today, even in the middle of you know, the worst pandemic since then, global life expectancy is just over 72. Right. So we have doubled the length of the average human life in that period. And this book begins with the idea that that is the single most important thing that has happened over the last hundred years. If a newspaper came out once a century, that would be the headline, I think. Is it appreciated? Or is it that, you know, every at any stage, people are like partway on that curve, you know, so like they never really get that full view? Yeah, I think it's not appreciated. I mean, if it was appreciated, <laughs> I think we yeah. wouldn't be here talking about the book because right. people would have a sense of it. And it's not appreciated for two reasons, I think. The, the first is that it's, it, it's progress in the, in the shape that progress normally takes, which is that it's slow and incremental and made out of you know, hundreds of thousands of small interventions. And slow incremental progress is the least interesting thing from a kind of a news cycle perspective, right? It just doesn't get covered. Um, and secondly, it's unlike other forms of progress, like your smartphone um, or a skyscraper, it, those are kind of tangible objects you can point to and say, look, wow, I have a supercomputer in my pocket. That's amazing. That's progress. With health, progress is measured in this bizarre way in non-events, right? The, the progress is, I didn't die of smallpox when I was two, or that accident I was in, I didn't, you know, die in the car accident because seatbelts were invented and I had to wear them. Um, and so we don't tend to think about events that didn't happen right. <laughs> for a reason, they yeah. didn't happen, right? And so we get this skewed sense of where the positive and big changes are happening. And it, it's also interesting, you point out, uh, particularly in the 19th century, say in England and in the United States, and then globally in different settings, that with the advent of industrialization, which is really kind of undergirding a lot of progress, there were predictable or, or not predictable there were measurable declines in health outcomes. Where yeah. did that come from? Because that also, it, I mean, industrialization and the move into cities allows for greater carrying capacity, but it actually brought life down in, you know, the 19th century England for a while. You know, it's a funny thing. That period, in, particularly in England, but also in, in the United States, um, from about 1750 to 1850, uh, I keep coming back and I've written about it a number of times. And, you know, sometimes people are like, well, you're just such a Anglophile, you know, you're just obsessed <laughs> with that period. And it's like, no, that period is really interesting because something is happening there for the first time 
in the history of the world that is then going to basically be exported to the rest of the rest of the world. And some of that is industrialization, some of that is urbanization, but it's also a story uh, of a transformation in health. And so two things are happening in that period. The first thing that's interesting is that some subset of the population in England starts to live longer in a steady, sustained way, starting around 1750. And you point out that that's actually wealthy people for the first time and that they were wealthy people were more likely to die younger than poor people or, or the average. Yeah. It, right before that, right. you actually had wealthy people because doctors were so bad. People, <laughs> the wealthy people would go see doctors and get these terrible cures. And they, that is you know, have one of, of the best parts of the book are the descriptions of like King George III, as well as George Washington being killed slowly or, yes. or driven mad by their doctors. Yeah. yeah. I mean, just the amount of arsenic that yeah. was prescribed back in the day. So, but starting around 1750, you see for the first time the beginnings of this kind of takeoff, sometimes called the Great Escape, where some people, wealthy people, start to live longer than the rest of the population. At the same time, the kind of the rest of the society, as it urbanizes and industrializes, starts to live shorter lives. And you begin to get this huge gap, which really didn't exist before. I mean, until 1750, it didn't matter whether you were the king of England or a pauper or a hunter-gatherer. You, your life expectancy was going to be the same. You start to get this gap. And by the time that people start measuring it, so there's a kind of a hero in the book, this guy, William Farr, who was a statistician in, in England in, in that period, he measured life expectancy in Liverpool around 1840, and it was 25 was the average length of life during that period. And that's happening because you're cramming all these people into these cities that are growing at an unprecedented rate. Um, We did not have an understanding of the waterborne nature of diseases like cholera. Um, You have obviously like respiratory viruses that are spreading because people are crammed together. You have pollution from uh, all these industrial plants. But mostly you have contaminated water supplies and you have a huge number of young children who start to die. In New York in 1850, 60% of all deaths were children. That's what life was like in those cities. And so industrialization, which ultimately leads to, in part, longer lives, in the beginning, the body count is just catastrophic. Um, So in the book, you talk about there are, you know, and I guess first, the increase in average life expectancy is mostly by decreasing the number of kids who die very young. Yes, but it's not all that. I mean, one of the things that's been interesting to me talking about this book now, having worked on this idea for four years, is there's a subset of people who have this response who say, that's just an illusion. Mm-hmm. It's it's just that infant mortality dropped. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of people who lived two days, mm-hmm. and that was just dragging right. the whole average down. And yeah, we fixed that, and that's great, but we really aren't living mm-hmm. longer. And that's that's not true. Right. It's a mix. It, so, and, and we can calculate this because we have this category of life expectancy at birth mm-hmm. in a society, and then life expectancy at other ages. And so... In 1850, in London, um, life expectancy at birth was about 41 or something like that. Um, But if you lived to 20, so you made it Mm -hmm. through the crucible of childhood and you were actually an adult, your life expectancy would be about 60. Today in the UK, a 20-year-old can expect to live to 85. Right. So we we had massive problems. 40% of children died before they reached adulthood for most of human history. We reduced that by a factor of 10 at least. And we're lengthening life at the end right. of life as well. So it's, it's, it's happening at both sides. So you talk about uh, interventions or changes that might have saved millions of people over the course of their life. And that includes things like anesthesia, the AIDS cocktail, angioplasty, obviously. You've listed them uh, alphabetically, yeah. kidney dialysis. You have interventions that are inventions that cr- saved hundreds of millions. That's antibiotics bifurcated needles, uh, chlorination, which is incredible, and pasteurization. One of the best chapters is the safe as milk, uh, you know, which yeah. is just the window. On, you know, that's a phrase everybody hears, but you don't yeah. know why milk was being touted as being safe until you know the history of it. Yeah. Not, But then you talk about things that save billions of people, and these uh, are artificial fertilizer, toilets, and sewers and vaccines. Let's talk a little bit about artificial fertilizer, about the growth of food uh, processing first. Like how, why, you know, how did that come about and why did it have such a profound effect? Yeah, it's a really important part of the story. And uh, one of the things we can measure this, 
one of the ways to measure it is to look at what the population of the world was 100 years ago, back when life expectancy was about 35. So it was just under 2 billion people. And right around at that point, um, in addition to the Spanish flu and, and World War I, there were terrible famines or terrible famines that were happening in India, terrible famines that were happening in the early days of the Soviet Union, some of them self-inflicted. There were terrible famines happening in Persia. Um, and today, of course, global population is just under 8 billion, right. and largely as a result of uh, improvements in human health that enabled us to live longer and our children to survive. If you had told someone <laughs> in 1920 that we're going to have four times as many people on the planet in 100 years, they would have said to you, no, we won't, because we'll never be able to, we can't feed 2 billion people in the current situation. And so, so now we have eight and most of them are fed. And most of them are fed. I mean, f famine as a, you know, catastrophic experience that kills hundreds of thousands or millions of, uh, of people in a society has effectively been eliminated. Now, you still have local famines that will pop up in, in situations, and you certainly have places in the world where there is chronic malnutrition. Um, but the idea of a mass starvation event um, really, ha I mean, the, the, the progress in that, particularly over the last 30 years, is astonishing. It's maybe some of the best news. Of and that, that is, I guess we kind of acknowledge that, but not really. And I'm old enough. I was born in the early 60s. I'm old enough to remember, you know, the population bomb and Paul yeah. Ehrlich talking about, okay, overpopulation is the biggest issue. But also, you know, up through Live Aid in the mid 80s, yeah. you know, is about African famines, which even then we realized they were more about politics than about agronomy or something. But like, that's all pretty much gone now. Yeah, it's an, it's an amazing story. And it, be, you know, it begins with artificial fertilizer, which is a really fascinating whole history. And then you have the Green Revolution, which kind of comes off of that. And, and you have, you know, organizations too that right. are, you know, kind of aid organizations that are, had, had to be invented to deal with these situations. So when you do have some kind of crop failure or political disturbance, you have organizations that can come in and, and yeah, but it's a good point. You know, like, like Bob Geldof isn't right. <laughs> isn't putting together. You Nobody know, rock remembers star. Bob Geldof. <laughs> well, you know, we're yeah, very but... old. We remember these things, but but um, we you know feed the world was the slogan, and like right. we are so much better at that. Right. And and the other thing about it too is that we underestimate. I mean, there's some wonderful work that's been um, done by people like uh, Robert Fogel that looked at. Um, just the, the the effects of chronic malnutrition on economic productivity. That you know, if you look at what we know about the diets of Europeans in the 1700s, um, is that they were kind of they might not have been having there were famines, of course, but they might not have been actually starving in large numbers. But they were really hungry, and you just can't be particularly productive in, in terms of labor if you're on the edge of starvation. And so by, uh, you know, starting in the mid 19th century, I guess like the, the kind of calorie count that was yeah. available to everybody just increased massively because yeah. of fertilization and better ways of, of creating food. And in fact, there, there was this famous theory that the improvements in human health, it's known as the, I think it's pronounced McEwen or McKeon, um, that this McKeon hypothesis that the, the health improvements and longevity improvements that you see at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century really didn't come from medicine, um, which is true, and we can talk about that, um, but that they in fact came from rising standards of living, largely like food production. That turned out to be not entirely true. Then really the, the improvements as we'll get to are, are, are more about public health and sanitation, but certainly having more food on the table is-, is Yeah, like your immune thing. system. I mean, you're more yeah. robust and resilient. Your Absolutely. immune system is better off. Absolutely. Um, you know, then, let, well, let's talk about toilets and sewers. Um, yeah. You know, like, you know, and obviously- Who doesn't want to? Yeah, you know, this is like the uh, Ralph uh, uh, Crammed and Ed Norton kind of honeymooners right. version of the world yeah. from underground. Um, how how does that play into this? And, and it's more, it's bigger than just toilets and sewers. It's clean water and everything, but- how, how, how did that come about? Yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, this is the problem that I have with the book when I, and with the, with the show, is they kind of shared the same vision, which is I had initially wanted to really quantify, like how, you know, if we got an extra 35 years of life, say, how many of those, how many of the days in that year did we get from this particular intervention or this particular intervention? And it turns out it's very hard to do that math exactly, in part because the, 
it's very unusual to have a kind of a single innovation that works on its own. So the macro change that made a probably the single biggest difference, um, maybe of all time, um, but certainly a massive difference to urban areas around the world in, over the last century and a half is just cleaning the drinking water. Mm -hmm. So water was, you know, in a big city like New York, where we are, or or, or London, um, in the middle of the 19th century, you would drink a glass of water and be dead in 48 hours from cholera, and that was just the reality of life. Um, and I'd written a whole book about this, yeah. you know, 16, 17 years ago, the ghost map about cholera in London. And so we, the, the first breakthrough was realizing that there were these waterborne diseases that were coming from contaminated water, and that some of that was coming from the fact that our human waste was right. <laughs> finding its way in these big crowded urban areas was finding its way into city into the the water supplies for big cities like the Thames in London um, and so once you had that insight you could say okay if we can build sewer systems that are attached to functioning toilets in people's homes rather than cesspools in their basements mm -hmm. um, and we can create reservoirs of water that is also separated from the where the waste is going. And eventually, later, um, at the end of the 19th century, the idea of chlorinating water came into being, which was very counterintuitive because chlorine is a poison if you drink it in but large quantities. But it's in large quantity if you drink yeah. a cup of bleach, you're in trouble. Yeah. But if you put a couple drops in your water, you're safe. Exactly. It's deadly for bacteria at that dosage. But um, Would you talk a bit, and uh, the book, uh, The Ghost Map, is about Jon Snow. Or, I mean, it's about a lot of things, but about the, yeah. the kind of understanding that cholera is waterborne as opposed to miasma. Yeah. Uh, which is kind of fascinating. But talk a little bit about Jon Snow, because he's also one of the central characters in this book and is a hero worth remembering at every opportunity. Well, the, I think one of the important things about Snow and about William Farr, who was the one who did those kind of analyses of life and death in Liverpool and, and other cities in that period, um, is that their primary tool in changing the story of human health in a very profound way was data. Right. So Snow had this idea that cholera was in the water and that there was some invisible organism that was in the water that was causing people to get sick. Everybody else thought it was in the air, it was in smells and things like that. And what's fascinating about Snow, and I think a really important for, lesson for us to remember, particularly in the context of COVID, is that he solved this mystery and convinced the world that waterborne diseases were a real thing and that there was this organism without ever seeing it. He didn't have, the microscopes of the day did not, he tried to see it, but he couldn't see this organism. It was too small for the lenses of the day. It took another 20 years before they were able to identify the bacterium that causes cholera. He saw it indirectly using data. So he famously kind of made this map of this outbreak in Soho in London uh, that showed that there was an intense concentration of death around this pump where people would get their water at a broad street um, in the middle of Soho. There's now a commemorative pump there mm -hmm. that people can visit on their cholera tours of London. And uh, I'm sure they're <laughs> picking up like herpes simplex or something. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. So he, by showing with you know, basically a data visualization technique, a, a map of kind of patterns of life and death in the streets of London, he was able to kind of solve this mystery and in fact, real change. And that's part of the argument that there's a chapter in the book, and we did an episode of the show just called Data, um, about this idea that in the, particularly at the beginning of an outbreak, when you don't have a vaccine or you don't have a therapeutic, um, even today, data is often our, our best defense. You know, it was funny reading that chapter in, in, um, in Extra Life. It reminded me of, as a, a good Foucauldian, mm. I believe, you know, Foucault in books like Discipline and Punish and The Birth of the Clinic and whatnot talks about statistics and data as a means of social control. Yeah. You know, and that, you know, yeah. essentially the French government and, you know, starting after Richelieu or during that period started counting people and counting what they did, et cetera, and as a means of control. And your book kind of offers up an alternative interpretation yeah. of that. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting you bring that up, Nick. That's a good point, because I was yeah. major, I mean, Foucault was the single probably biggest influence in, sure. in, in, for me intellectually when I was in college. Anybody um, who you know studied <laughs> English or cultural yeah. studies, literary or cultural studies yeah. in the past 50 years. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I, in grad school, I studied with Said, who, who yeah. had kind of brought Foucault and Orientalism, right. brought it to, to the United States in, in many ways. Um, and I think that's right. I mean, you know, I think with the Foucauldian um, critique of 
data and surveillance as a means of social control. Um, when you contrast that with the argument that Extra Life makes, which is that we end up getting, you know, major breakthroughs in health and longevity from uh, from those kinds of surveillance techniques, I think it's possible that both those things can be true. Right. Right. That that they set up. I mean, obviously, it's possible. Like once you create a, a kind of a surveillance state that is monitoring all these different levels, um, and knows statistically all these things about you, that then becomes a tool that can be exploited for, you know, negative ends, but it also has this history of, uh, of positive outcomes as well. Um, and I don't think, I think it's very hard to solve the problems that you have with urbanization uh, and with industrialization that you will inevitably have when you gather that many people into that small amount of space. Um, you can't solve those health problems without some kind of surveillance mechanism um but it has it, it it's come around for full circle in, intellectually that's great yeah well and you know there well it's a kind of tangent but even among foucault foucault scholars they're starting to see where he wasn't necessarily against all forms of this experience. yeah um, but i think yeah. you know the, the important thing about the value of that i think that, that that it left in my mind and this is this is one of the things that i say about the life expectancy story is you know even with life expectancy it's a mixed bag Right. I mean, we have this population problem on, on some fundamental level. We have climate change because of the advances in public health that we've made in, in medicine. Right. If if we would kept the population at two billion, we could have industrialized all we want, but there just wouldn't be enough people to really affect the atmosphere with carbon um, if we'd stayed at that level. And so I think the important thing to stress with these things, and, and this is where Foucault is useful, is that he was he was observing a change in society that was you know, incredibly important and that it had elements that were progressive and it had elements that were reactionary um, was was probably to be expected. And it's now, I mean, a lot of economists are talking about, you know, because global population is going to level off and start declining. And in places like Japan, which has fewer people than it had in 2000, you know, can you have an economy that actually works if you have fewer and fewer people? So it's... and and the aging. I mean, this is why. Yeah, it's it it it. As I said at the beginning, I think it's the most important story because, you know, you have an aging population um, that has economic implications, where you know most of the people are old and in retirement and not doing their you know youthful vital uh, jobs, but it also affects everything from politics. I mean, I did a kind of back of the envelope calculation. Um, that I didn't put in the book, but you know I think it's right, which is that if the overall distribution of um, you know the population by age had stayed the same as where it was in 1950, and everyone in those age groups voted the same way, Trump would have lost in a landslide, and Brexit would have lost in a landslide. Hmm. And so what we're seeing is with some of these political events is what happens when people live a lot, a lot longer life. A lot of the people who voted for Trump would have been dead. In 1950, a lot of people who voted for Brexit would have been dead in 1950. Now they're not, and so that is steering the society. And this in is, ways. if one of my pet theories is, we're in a long kind of 20th century that started with Bismarck and the welfare state. The welfare state in America and throughout the West is about old people, and they, we are getting older and voting. You know, we're skewing all sorts of yeah. kind of uh, political ends. Um, you know, the snow story also gives rise to. Um, you, in a, in a way, your work has always been going back to your early, I guess, your first book, Interface Culture. It's always been about networks and about groups of people producing results as opposed to the lone genius. But in Extra Life, you really kind of put a stake through the heart of the lone genius theory. And you talk about how Jon Snow, super important as an individual uh, and many other individuals throughout, but the lone genius is something we should put to rest. What, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I... I think actually, if you look back at my work, that the, the it's it's about network collaboration, but also about this question of how and and why ideas emerge in the first place. When when big momentous ideas show up, like what how did how do they happen? And that's what led me to the network model. Yeah. Right? I was trying to figure out like when a new genuinely transformative idea shows up on the scene, whether it's a scientific idea or a cultural idea, 
you know, a technological idea, which is what was going on in interface culture so many years ago. Thank you for mentioning that very obscure book yeah. from 1997. <laughs> that I mean, but that's the era we're living. I mean, you right. know, it's funny you talk about like uh, studying English. Yeah. You know, I. You know, I'm sure you grew, you know, you were early on, you were like, well, you know what, there are genius authors, there are right. people who yeah. are in their garret. And, you know, it's a romantic ideal of a, a really smart person, usually a man, but not exclusively, who just comes up with something that's great and is trans historical, but that's horseshit, right? Yeah. And like, if nothing else, the past 30 or 40 years of cyber culture has shown that it's, yes. it's all about networks. Right. So what's changed a little bit in my thinking that is building on that network idea, is that I spent so much time focusing on how the original idea forms. And in book after book after book showed how it was almost always collaborative, usually multidisciplinary collaborative work where people with different forms of expertise come together and borrow ideas from each other. And that's how the original seed of the idea starts. But what Extra Life does that I haven't done so much before is focus on how those ideas then get big enough in, into circulation so that they make a difference in the world. And you know, you alluded earlier to the story of, of milk in the book, and that's maybe the best example of this. So milk was incredibly dangerous in the middle of the 19th century, which is hilarious to think <laughs> and about. And the phrase is swill milk. Swill milk, right, yeah, it's yeah. a classic New York story. Yeah, could you explain the, like the, what the, swill milk was? Basically, New York grew so quickly that you couldn't, um, you couldn't get all this beautiful pasture that used to be in kind of northern Manhattan basically got eaten up by the growth of the city. And we didn't have mechanical fr refrigeration back then. And so milk would spoil if it was coming in too, from too far away. And so they figured out this way to keep cattle, you know, in like the meatpacking district with um, where they would get slop left over from distilleries and they would feed them basically the waste product from making whiskey, which just, you know, obviously right in the face of it. You'd That's think, good. That's <laughs> like, you know, it's, uh, recycling. it's recycling. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, maybe on paper it's out of good, but it turned out to be not healthy at all. And you had tuberculosis in milk. So milk was a big problem. And it is also great that there were dairy farms in Manhattan, yeah. like when it was being filling up with you know, immigrants are becoming like um, unbelievably densely popular. Well, I think one of the things people forget about that period, you know, we think about horses, but there's just a lot of livestock yeah. in in big cities. Same thing with London. Um, so milk was deadly, major killer of young children in that period. And this is one of those classic cases where we would, you know, a lot of people would be like, I know how we solved that. It's written right there on the carton, pasteurization. We solved it with chemistry. And, you know, a lot of this is this is something that's taught in schools, unlike a lot of what's in the book, which is, you know, Louis Pasteur and the germ theory. And he comes up with this innovation. And so we can think, oh, science solved it, you know. But in fact, pasteurization is invented in 1865. And we don't have pasteurized milk as the standard on the shelves in New York until 1915. So it doesn't matter if some French chemist comes up with an idea in a lab somewhere. What matters is when does the milk get safe? And that was a 50 year process. And it involved not just science, it involved activism and legal reform and speeches. And there was a whole like kind of make milk safe social movement that happened. There was this guy, Nathan Strauss, who's one of the unlikely heroes of the book, who was the like, co-owner of Macy's. He's right, like a department right. yeah, store. Yeah, and, and before gave. that, the Brooklyn chain, yeah. Abraham and Strauss, which yeah, yeah. got sucked up by Macy's. Yeah, and, and he became a big pasteurized milk advocate, and he was a major figure. That's in a kind of subgenre of character in, your, in, in this work is the kind of millionaire or the, the <laughs> successful businessman who then has a crazy, like, yeah. Half the time they're crazy, uh, like yeah. James Hill or something, the yeah. railroad builder. But other times, and 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 also a sub character in the sense of um, a non scientist, non physician. Right. There are a lot of those figures in the book that it, that it takes people who who just happen to be good proselytizers to get. I, I didn't really pronounce that word very well, but <laughs> to, <laughs> to to get you know to advance ideas. Yeah. And there, and that's part of the network. That, that that's basically what I'm saying is that that you know. There's a network that inevitably has to happen for ideas to form, and then there's a network, a wider network generally, 
um, often involving non-specialists. Could you, you know, a really great example in the book is, and this was mostly news to me, uh, about the way in which penicillin yeah. went from being discovered. And, you know, a, a lot of people are familiar with the kind of accidental discovery of penicillin, but then how penicillin got ramped up to a point where you, you make the argument that it essentially was one of the reasons why the Allies won World War II, yeah. because we had penicillin and the Germans, for a variety of reasons, did not. The core thing about the story of penicillin is that, um, yes, Alexander Fleming discovers it on his messy desk with his Petri dish. And that's the famous story. But on some level, while that was an important breakthrough and, you know, Fleming ultimately got part of the Nobel Prize for it appropriately, um, the real problem with penicillin was could you make enough of it to save one human being from a deadly bacterial infection, much less the world? And there was a long period of time where that was very much in question. Fleming really never investigated that. It was kind of he discovers this promising mold and then kind of abandons the idea. And it gets picked up at the beginnings of World War II with folks at Oxford originally who realized that, you know, this is this could be a, a huge asset in the war because as with every military conflict probably in history, more soldiers were dying of infections back in the hospital than they were from the original kind of wound that they received. And so if you could keep those soldiers alive with a magic bullet of penicillin, of antibiotics, it would be a huge advantage. And that effort ended up being this amazing kind of thrilling story of these scientists, both at Oxford, and then they travel across because the Blitz is starting in in the, uh, in England, so it's too dangerous to work there. And so the US government brings them over and they do all this amazing work. And uh, to me, like that's the ultimate example of why our, our historical memory is skewed in the wrong way. Like if you ask people, what's the famous story about a brilliant network of scientists from around the world racing against the clock to make a scientific breakthrough that will help the allies win World War II? Everyone will say, the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb. But it's just as true of the story of penicillin. And yet, actually, that made more of a difference. Yeah. And it was a positive effect right, in the right. world rather than a weapon of mass destruction. Um, well, let's talk about uh, vaccinations then and vaccines. Um, and this, again, uh, incredibly well written, but uh, and I'm going to mispronounce it. Uh, how did we get from variolation yeah. to vaccination? Variolation is this really interesting procedure that is ancient. We don't mm -hmm. know exactly where it was first discovered and implemented, and it was probably independently discovered in multiple places around the world, did not develop um, natively in the West. It was not the product of Enlightenment science. It was basically kind of a, a cruder version of vaccination. Um, it was developed largely to fight smallpox, which was one of the most deadly diseases in the world, maybe in the history of, the, uh, of human civilization. And it basically involved finding somebody who had these smallpox, smallpox pustules, scraping a little bit off of it, and inserting a small amount, um, usually with a little incision in their arm with a lancet, and, and basically giving people a very low dose exposure to, to the de deadly smallpox pathogen itself, which would then cause them to get a mild case of smallpox and then lifelong immunity. 2% of the time they would die. But it was such a deadly disease. Well, that's that pretty good odds. Those were better yeah. odds than just leaving yeah. your kids particularly And exposed. you talk a lot about how a, an English traveler, a woman, saw it in Turkey. So yeah. you have this weird moment where as Turkey is kind of fading or the Ottoman Empire yeah. is fading, it actually, that's like a huge gift to the West. And yeah, it's this amazing figure from that period, Mary Montagu, um, who was married to the ambassador um, to Constantinople, to Turkey. And, and uh she observes this procedure that was commonplace there, and she has her children variolated, who are the first known British subjects to be variolated. And then because she's an influencer in the day, I mean, again, another mm -hmm. figure like this, non-medical figure, she persuades the Princess of Wales to uh, variolate their children. And basically that practice then spreads through British society in the 1700s, and it's one of the reasons why you start to see this right. takeoff. In life so she among is the to smallpox what Kim Kardashian is to criminal justice reform. That's a beautiful way. Now I now I find it all it's it, yeah. all making sense. But again, it's these networks that yeah. are really kind of uh, really kind of happenstance too, yeah. right? I mean, like the more networks or the more connections you have, the more likely something good, I guess, is going to happen. And Jenner, who Edward Jenner, who invents the the actual first smallpox vaccine, which uses cowpox instead mm -hmm. of smallpox as the kind of the agent to induce 
immunity. He himself was very elated, and he practiced very elation throughout his career as a physician. So the idea was an improvement on, a refinement on this earlier practice rather than this sudden transformation. I mean, vaccination is a big deal. It really did make a difference, yeah. and Jenner deserves the accolades he has. But it's a, again, it's a more complicated right. story. You know, the book in many ways, and this, you know, particularly for a libertarian audience, it it presents both. It's it's fascinating because it's a history of the march of science and mm. progress. Kind of with a capital P, um, you know, even if people are a little nervous about that kind of stuff. But it is all in the kind of guise of public health in a lot of ways. Mm. And can you talk a bit about where does the end of kind of either individual initiative or non-mandated initiative for you, where does that kind of come to an end and then it has to be pushed into, you know, a kind of more coercive state apparatus to spread this stuff throughout? Well, you know, it's there in the history of vaccines. I mean, anti-vax movements are as old as vaccines. I mean, they were stronger in the 19th century. And, you know, they were responding to mandatory vaccination laws that were passed in that period. Um, and I think, you know, the, the argument that I would make to, to someone approaching it from a kind of a, a, a purely libertarian argument is that there, there is something in the nature of contagious diseases that makes it harder to stick to the ground of my personal choices are my personal choices because you do have a wider you're in a network of contagion right. as long uh, alongside the network of ideas that you're in and the truth is that you are by choosing to not be vaccinated against a deadly disease that is currently you know uh, uh, highly present in, in a community you are endangering other people with that choice and so it's it's you can have other parts of society where you say no it's important to stick to these libertarian principles but i think in the particularly in the case of a, a, you know of viruses where there is this transmission chain that is so important um, that's a point where we need to fi we need to figure out a way for people to be able to stay true to their libertarian beliefs if they have them while making room for, for some of the interventions that public health require. Reaching uh, like herd immunity, whatever is the the fastest way there, or the most efficient yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things, because obviously this is all taking place with COVID as a backdrop, um, and you mentioned, you know, the, the biggest pandemic since uh, the 1918 flu um, or, or the Spanish flu. Um, how um, you know? How do you rate you? You talk about the FDA um, and the CDC and the WHO, the World Health Organization. Yeah. At one point, you talk about the World Health Organization as kind of like over the past seventy years or since it's been around, like no, no agency has done more to help extend human life. Yeah. How do you think the WHO has done in the past year or so with COVID and? Um, you know, FDA, CDC, these are all authorities that have taken a lot of hits yeah. for a lot of good reasons. Yeah, I think it has been a, a mixed bag. I mean, I think we will look back on this period with the long view, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, which is generally the view that I try and take on everything, perhaps to a fault, yeah. and say what was most amazing about this period is uh, most important about this period is the speed at which we developed the vaccines and 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 tested the vaccines and distributed them um particularly in a country like the united states um that is my, it is such a mind-boggingly incredible and this is something i mean we were talking uh anthony fauci was talking a year ago about how it could be a couple of years yeah. before vaccines come out and they were ready to go like messenger rna vaccines were being made within days of the genetic sequence of the disease. The, being the, the story that I always, you know, just raised as a comparison is that it took us four years to identify, just to identify the virus that caused AIDS in, in the 80s. So just imagine COVID where it's four years before we even know what is causing the outbreak. That's what would have happened if we if this just shifted 20 years, 30 years earlier in terms of when this outbreak happened. So uh, your chapter on polio or your discussion of polio yeah. is like that, too, where there were vaccines by the mid 50s. But yeah. it took a long time to even kind of roll them out. And obviously, we had been dealing with polio for a long time yeah. before that. So the vaccines are an, am an amazing story. I, I think we did not have, interestingly, like we did not have the kind of um, international repository of data um, that you would have expected to have had for, everybody knew we were gonna have a respiratory virus 
pandemic at some point, you know, whether it was going to be this bad, but, you know, this was not a surprise to anybody who studied this at all. And if you look at a lot of the early kind of data collection, trying to figure out what was really going on, we were flying blind. And a lot of the folks that actually created the data sets were folks who did it on a volunteer level, you know? Um, and so that created, um, you know, we talked about how important data is in the early days of an outbreak that created an opening then for some of our political leaders to try and shut down the identification of data and, and, you know, make it sound like the caseloads were less than they were. So there were mistakes made that then got amplified by people at organizations like the CDC and the WHO. Um, I don't know. I, I think there's a legitimate question about how China was handled in all of this. Right. And th that's a big part of the criticisms of the WHO. I honestly don't, I haven't really studied that part of it. So I, I should just kind of refrain from, from talking about it. But I hope that it doesn't, I mean, you know, it, it, one of the stories that's probably the most important to me in this, um, but, and it really comes out, I think, in the, in the TV version and the conversation I do with Larry Brain about this, which is the, the, the story of smallpox eradication and how momentous an achievement that was. And, you know, the CDC and particularly the WHO were, right. in, we couldn't have done it without that kind of institution. And so I hope we don't come out of COVID with a sense of, you know, oh, public health organizations and institutions are, you know, ineffective. And But can I, you know, you mentioned the AIDS, the FDA, you know, and, and there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of blame to be had. And also sure. just, you know, this was a novel thing that nobody knew how to deal with. But the FDA was terrible. I mean, yeah. you know, it, it took AIDS yeah. activists to Absolutely. really kind of, you know, challenge the FDA. Um, you know, what are what are the types of ways in which something like the FDA? We're also fifty years into a steady decline in trust and confidence in all institutions, whether it's big business or big government and yeah. philanthropies and whatnot. How might the FDA or the CDC kind of revamp itself so that it actually, you know, is more efficient than you know than what it is now? Yeah, and there's another even more relevant question, I mean, not that that wasn't relevant, but there's an even more uh, timely question ab about regulatory oversight of drug development or vaccine developments, which is, as you said, we had the COVID vaccines in, you know, we had the basic prototype for them in February of, right. of 2020, right? right? Yeah. I mean, that's shocking. And so, and we had, you know, early phase one results, you know, in the middle of 2020, we knew that they worked, it seemed like they worked, whatever. Um, there's an argument that, you know, at a certain point, it was it would have been better to just start distributing them, right. given the number of people that were going to die over the next, if we'd known particularly how bad the winter was right. going to be, that actually breaking all the rules and just accelerating the process mm -hmm. and getting them into arms earlier. And if we see problems, we see problems and we deal with them. Um, Almost certainly, that would have saved more lives and net net, you know, uh, even if there had been and that's, unseen with public health, it is kind of it's a numbers game, right? It's like cost versus benefit. So, you know, it, you, yeah. you don't want to have, you know, you don't want to have a drug that goes out and kills more people right. than it saves. But when you know that it's not going to do that, it's yeah. kind of criminal not to. The, the problem is there's also first do no harm. Right. And so if you you know, willingly, knowingly give people a drug where you say, we don't really know whether it's safe or not. And it turns out not to be safe, even if it saves more lives on average. Right. It's it's not pure utilitarianism. Right, right. Right. Um, and so there is a sense of particularly because you're talking about public trust as well. And so if you release a vaccine that turns out to be, even though it's saving more lives uh, in the end, if it kills a significant number right. of people through some kind of side effect you haven't detected yet, that erodes public trust, particularly in the age of the internet. So it's a very complicated decision. But the, the, again, there's a problem with these kinds of institutions, it, which is that we never hear about the success stories. You know, I mean, I wrote in um, in Future Perfect, this book I wrote a number of years ago, I wrote about... Um, the, the, the chicken gun that the FAA uses to test jet engines, you know, they throw these, you know, bird strike uh, simulations, which which ended up being kind of central to the design of the Airbus that survived the bird strike and the famous miracle on the Hudson. And, you know, when something like that happens, 
all we hear about is Captain Sully, the hero pilot, and we don't hear about like, wow, there were so many years of like testing these engines. And Forget the humans, Gojo. the chickens. That, <laughs> yeah, that think of all the cost of the, all yeah. They don't get they get chicken run. Right? <laughs> exactly. They don't get a uh, Sully. So, so we don't have. I mean, that's part of part of what I try and do. And you know, there's some like heroic bureaucrats <laughs> in Extra Life. That's you know, a tough. Yeah, that's a you tough. You don't hear sell, that a lot, right? right? Yeah, and. Yeah. And again, it's it's trying to figure out, and, and you know, particularly in thinking about it in a libertarian context, like you know, do you know, surely there is some r role for some kind of oversight sure. when we're talking about drugs, um, and but it's know, when it takes you know a decade plus and right. tens of billions of dollars to bring a marginally improved version of an existing drug to market, something yes. has gone haywire. Yeah, and so we need to figure out like where have we done it well, right? And where where have you know you want to in a sense be able to test this hypothesis, right? Like how many how many times did we did we slow down something that you know would have actually been better if we'd released it right. earlier and and actually see what the record is? It's just very hard to see that. Uh, it's not. What would you you know what are what are possible ways that um, organizations like the FDA or CDC could regain? You know, because, uh, you know, kind of trust or confidence. And I was looking, uh, I was separate from this. Pew Research in 2015 did a, a survey where they asked people based on political ideology, like, do you think childhood vaccination is safe? 12% of liberals said no, 10% of conservatives. Now we have a, a world in which, you know, a majority of like Republican men don't want the COVID vaccine. Uh, you know, and so like it's clear like vaccination, you know, conjures up a lot of fears and it seems to be kind of politically fungible it's yeah. you know depending on who's in office or whatever but what what are ways that the fda or cdc might regain um kind of a moral or scientific or you know uh, political high ground you know what one thing i think that uh, i've been wrestling with a lot over the whole covid crisis on a personal level but i think it has implications for society and for institutions particularly like the fda and the cdc which is all of this at heart is about risk, mm -hmm. right? Trying to calculate like how risky is this particular behavior, or this particular strategy, and you know, what is the magnitude of the risk? And one of the problems that I think public health authorities have is that one, human beings don't, aren't good at calculating risk right. intuitively. And you know, the difference between, um, you can say, well, this is riskier than that, but if the, you know, is it, you know, 5% right. riskier or is it 500 times riskier? And there is a massive difference there. And we don't, we, we basically don't have a standardized way of talking about risk that people can understand. And I actually, I've come to this, I've, I've been floating around there. I'm going to share with you for the first time this hair brain scheme that I have, which is there's been some talk about a unit of risk. Um, and sometimes it's called a mort, right? A mortality, or like right. what is, the, you know, and the problem is that in the abstract, just one mort isn't really a useful kind of idea. But I think you could, you could, we know very precisely the risk from, from driving automobiles, right? Um, you know, there's X number of fatalities per 100 million miles driven. So you can say, th you know, one mort or one auto mort <laughs> is the risk that you take by driving 100 miles. If you take a road trip, you know, for two hours, you, this is the mortality risk of that. Most of us happily take, you know, two hour car rides without really worrying about it. But we know there's some risk there. So then once you have that as something that people kind of intuitively understand, you could then say, hey, by the way, like I did, again, back of the envelope calculations of this, just walking around New York City at the height of the COVID epidemic here, unmasked, you know, in March was um, 2,000 auto morts. <laughs> it was 2,000 times more dangerous than driving two miles in your, two, two hours in your car. And so if you could figure out a way to kind of express this to people where it's like, look, what is your... What is your risk? Are you a, are you a daredevil skier? You know, are you the person who you know makes sure that they're belted up when they drive? Are you what? Where are you in the spectrum? And here's here's here are the actual you know order of magnitude impacts of these choices. You know, if you if you wear a mask, you're going to reduce it by this many morts. If you get vaccinated, it's going to be you know a thousand times safer. And just kind of having a way of ex describing it. Um, that actually allows people to say, okay, I, I know where I am on kind of risk tolerance. I would think if we can come up with like incredible schematics of the heat of buffalo style chicken wings, <laughs> right. we should be able to yeah. come up with something, <laughs> right? right? right. Um, what, um, you know, as, as a final kind of topic of conversation, what's in the pipeline 
to you know what's the next doubling of yeah. human age what you know what's the what's the timeline for that if there is one and what are the likely things that are really going to produce yeah. the next big leaps yeah it's a great question so two things um it, it, we have a very clear path um despite the last year where life expectancy is going to go backwards because of covid we have a very clear path, I think, to raising, you know, life expectancy in the U.S. about 77 and parts of the world like Japan's 85, whatever. You know, we can get that to 90, 95 um, just using the existing tools we have, the the ones that are just coming up like immunotherapy for cancer and things like that. We're going to, you know, we, we have, you know, we have some amazing things in our arsenal. RNA as a platform is going to be really important. Um, but there's there seems to be an outer boundary of how long people can live. And that, that boundary has grown a little bit, but it's very hard to live past 110. Um, it you know, happens vanishingly small. So a lot of people are going to live to 100. But the question is, can we push through that outer boundary and you know, actually live to 120 or 150 and, and, as you say, double it again? And that will only happen if we have a you know, real paradigm shift in our understanding of aging and the aging process itself. And there are a lot of interesting people out there who are not, you know, cranks, who think that... There are also a lot there of, are a lot of uninteresting cranks. cranks but yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. yes, but there are a lot of serious scientists out there who believe that, you know, I mean, when you're 25, if you can remember what that was like, I, remember. I could barely remember it, yeah. as somebody about to turn 53, um, you know, you have this period of your life after you grow into an adult before you hit about 35 where your body really doesn't age. Like nothing really changes during that period. And what we've come to realize is that that's something is happening to keep your body from aging during that period. Like your cells are being instructed to repair themselves constantly and not age. And so the question is, could you instruct those cells to just keep going with that process longer and basically keep everyone kind of permanently 30 years old? If we do that, then you then you can imagine a scenario where we have people living into their you know 150s, and we think that population is going to level off in the middle of the you know second half of the 21st century, and we're going to have declining global populations. But if people start living to 150, that's all bets are off. All right. Well, we're going to leave it there. We've been talking with Stephen Johnson, author most recently of Extra Life: A Short History of Living Longer. Thanks for talking. Oh, thanks, Nick.